Should I go ahead, go ahead and start, Pastor? And do I need anything to get this working, or it's if it's working, it's working. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I think I will go ahead and get started here. Um, thank you for for having us here at your Mission Festival Sunday today. I am Jonathan Federwitz, and here with my wife Carrie and our daughter Rachel, our youngest daughter. We have four children. We'll we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, there might be other people in the room you don't recognize, so I'll just introduce them so you don't have to wonder who they are. So it's it, uh, Carrie's brother Eric is here, and uh, his wife Tracy. Uh, visiting from the Twin Cities, Minnesota. And it was family weekend at Concordia, Wisconsin, down in Mequon, and so they came down for that and and joined us for today. It's been, um, I don't know when we first came to St. John, uh, probably 25 years ago or so, before we went over to Papua New Guinea. I was probably here before that. I don't remember when I, I know I was here before that. I don't remember how long before that when my parents came to speak and I was a kid. You were in eighth grade. I was in eighth grade, okay. <laughs> that's, that's my Aunt Barb Shallock. Yeah, so, so um, that's the connection here. Is she's my, my aunt, Uncle Gary and Aunt Barb, and my cousin Carmen here. And um, when you were here, your twins were like in somewhere in grade School age. Okay, yes. We probably actually came with our twins when they were babies the first time and then in grade school and so forth. So it's been a while and I was, I was encouraged to see on your wall here um, still the, the memory and honor of my father, Dale Federwitz, who passed away um, a number of years ago. Uh, but you, you, the congregation here has been supportive of, of the Federwitzes for many, many years. So my dad, Dale and Alvina, uh, my mother, Alvina, and then um, a lot of you know my siblings, uh, Paul Federwitz, um, who was a classmate of pastors, um, my other brother, David Federwitz, and also classmate of yours. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, so there, there is quite a bit of connection here. My, my sister, uh, Becca Deloach, and her husband, Danny, um, all have served in missions with uh, Lutheran Bible translators or Wycliffe Bible translators. We are members of both Wycliffe Bible Translators and Lutheran Bible Translators and have been in Papua New Guinea for 23 years. And I've been serving there as a missionary pilot. So although I don't do Bible translation specifically myself, I serve those who do. I make Bible translation possible in the remote parts of Papua New Guinea by providing air transportation to take people into places where there are no roads. And so it's just small bush airstrips grass, dirt, airstrips, um, and it's their connection, their lifeline to the outside world. Papua New Guinea has rugged mountainous terrain and travel is very difficult there. So that's what we've been doing for 23 years. And the first part of our presentation is going to be a report on what we've been doing there um, for those, those 23 years, Sent, uh, really letting you know what's been going on in the last four years since we were here last time in October of, of 2018. Um, and then we're going to tell you about a shift in our ministry. We're moving to uh, a home assignment, we call it, where I will be working in North Carolina uh, preparing missionary pilots to go overseas, using the experience that I've had on the mission field to prepare the next generation of missionaries to go overseas. So we'll tell you a bit more about that in a little bit. But first, I'll have my wife come up introduce a bit about what she's been doing and introduce our video. And I'm told you need to use this so that people who are watching can hear you. Sorry, you'll have to excuse me. I've never used one of these. Oh, okay. It's fine. It's, yeah, it's straight with the hair. Wow. Okay. Okay, is that good? Okay, I'm going to assume that's good. All right, well, uh, my job, my main job as we've been overseas has actually been um, really supporting Jonathan's work. As a wife and mother, my job has been to take care of the family, and that is full-time job over there. We don't have... 
Uh, I don't have the modern conveniences that we're used to here in the US, so I don't get to work with any of that. I make most of my food from scratch. Um, trying to keep a house clean is definitely full time when you're either surrounded by mud or dust and dirt the, the entire year. Um, so that's been my main job. My main focus is just to keep the house running, to make sure that uh, everybody is doing well and, and getting to where they need to be. Um, my, my second job uh, has actually been to work as a substitute teacher at the elementary school that we have there on our mission center. Um, so I've been doing that for a little over, it's been over 15 years that I've been working as a substitute teacher. Once our youngest was kind of old enough and into school, I felt like I could give a little bit of my time to do that. Um, so I've been working as a substitute teacher and have absolutely loved it. It's been a wonderful experience. Um, getting to work with the kids in all of the grades and um, just and a wonderful staff over there of, of teachers who are there just all to support the work of Bible translation. Um, and so I know what I really love about it is knowing that when I'm going in and I'm teaching the kids, I'm helping um, those translators and other people who are over there in support roles to help the translators. I'm helping them to be able to do their jobs because they can focus on what they've come to do. Uh, instead of needing to, um, uh, if, if that wasn't an option to have a school, everybody would need to homeschool, which um, for some people is harder than others. And so I'm able to, to help out by knowing that they can then uh, go over there, whether they're tr doing translation work or literacy work or other jobs. Um, so that's, it's been a really fun job for me. I've, I've loved doing it the last several years. Um, and I know I will truly miss it um, coming back. We'll miss having that experience over there uh, working with the kids and the staff. So that's what I've done. Um, what we're gonna do for you now is go ahead and just show you a short video that we've got um, that will just explain to you a little bit more about uh, our work over there, what it is that we do. Uh, you'll get to see what the country looks like and, and what, our, what our home area looks like where, where we've been over there. So we'll do that for you now and uh, we'll have some more to share afterwards. Kelsey, can we put that microphone by the speaker? Yeah, that's that'd be a good idea. We had the lights here. Yes, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea since 1999. Jonathan is a pilot and uses aviation to support Bible translation in PNG. It is our goal to see everyone in PNG receive God's word in the language that speaks to them best so that they can understand the message of the gospel. Papua New Guinea is a country located on tropical islands in the Pacific Ocean just north of Australia. The country of Papua New Guinea is about the same size as the state of California. There are over 800 language groups in the country. About 300 of those languages still do not have any scripture. Many people in PNG are subsistence farmers. Their main crops include yam, taro, and cow cow. Cow cow is the most common staple food and is similar to a sweet potato. They also eat many tropical fruits including bananas, papaya, pineapple, citrus fruit, and passion fruit. Their diets are supplemented with wild game or fish. Papua New Guinea is not a developed country. Specifically, there is not a road infrastructure built throughout the country. The few roads that do exist are not in very good condition and do not join the various regions of PNG. That is the primary reason that we have an aviation program. 
Often in just a matter of minutes, we can fly over a distance that would require many hours or even days to travel by ground. Not only is air travel much quicker, but it is also much less exhausting, and therefore gives the translators more time and energy for their primary goal of Bible translation. We live in Ukarumpa, located in the Eastern Highlands Province, which is in central Papua New Guinea. Ukarumpa is the mission center, which provides many services to support missionaries that work throughout the country, and is a training center to equip national translators who partner with us in the work of Bible translation. The missionaries and national translators travel between Ukarumpa and their remote locations. The airplane that I fly is called a Kodiak. It has a powerful turboprop engine and has been specifically designed for bush flying. It also incorporates modern technology with a nice glass cockpit. It can carry up to nine passengers, but often I remove some of the seats to make room to carry supplies for our missionaries. On a routine day, I'll make half a dozen stops or more to airstrips where we have translation programs. On my first stop or two, I drop off the people that are going out to their remote locations. I might also have a few stops to drop off mail and other supplies. For most of our missionaries, their only means of getting supplies is through our airplanes that fly into their tiny airstrips. On my last stop or two of the day, I pick up missionaries or national translators who are going to our mission center at Ukarampa. There are a few things that make flying in PNG both interesting and challenging. One of those is the mountainous terrain. Many of the mountain ranges extend from 10,000 up to over 14,000 feet. The terrain is very beautiful, but it often means that I have to follow valleys and look for gaps in the mountains to get from one place to another. Another challenge is the weather. PNG is located just a few degrees south of the equator, so the weather is very tropical. This means that clouds and rain showers are the norm, so I find myself needing to navigate around the weather to get to where I'm going. A third challenge is the tiny airstrips. Airstrips in PNG are generally made and maintained by hand. As a result, most airstrips are under 2,000 feet long and some are as short as 1,000 feet. Also, many airstrips are built along a ridge or on the side of a mountain. These airstrips are sloped, so only have one-way access. While short and sloped airstrips are a challenge, I know that using these airstrips save the translators hours of travel by land. So for me, the challenge is rewarding. My primary role has been to support Jonathan's work by taking care of the home and family. There are many things about being a wife and mother that are the same for me in Papua New Guinea as it would be in America, but there are a few things that are different. One thing that is different is shopping. We don't have a variety of stores to choose from. Instead, there is one small, basic general store that has been set up for the mission community. It does not have the variety of products that we are used to in the U.S., but it does supply most of our needs. Many times, what's on my menu is dictated by what's available at the store. The store is only open from 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. There is no convenience store on the corner, so if I've forgotten something for supper on Saturday, I've got to come up with another plan. Something else that is different is getting laundry done and dried without a clothes dryer. As Jonathan mentioned, the tropical weather in PNG includes a lot of clouds and rain. During dry season, it is fairly easy to get the clothes dry. However, during rainy season, it is usually rainy and cloudy all day. And even on good days, we often have downpours that seem to come from nowhere. Another thing that is different is the lack of places to go. When we are in the U.S., I enjoy occasionally going to a restaurant or shopping at the mall. In Ukarampa, it is a two-hour drive to the nearest town with shopping and restaurants and that's a two-hour drive over windy roads filled with potholes. However, despite some of the challenges, there are many things that I enjoy about living in Ugrumpa. It is nice to live on a mission center where everywhere I need to go from day to day is close by, and I can walk when the weather is nice. I also know just about everybody in our close-knit community, which means there is always someone to help when I have a need, even for that item that I forgot at the store. Now that our children are older, I have been able to get involved with other things. I have been serving as a substitute teacher at the elementary school that we have for missionary kids. I generally teach one or two days a week, but sometimes I have filled in for a month or two to cover gaps in the teaching staff. I enjoy teaching, but also enjoy the flexibility that subbing affords me to still be home for my family when needed. Although there have been some challenges during our time on the mission field, the rewards have also been great. 
One of the rewards that we have seen during our time in PNG is the number of translation projects that have been finished. While we were in Papua New Guinea, one full Bible and almost 100 New Testament translations were dedicated. That brings the total New Testaments completed by Wycliffe and Lutheran Bible translators' involvement in PNG to 217. We have had the privilege of attending some of those dedications. It is a real joy to see people receive God's Word for the first time in the language of their heart. This is the reason that we have gone to PNG, so that people can receive God's Word in the language that speaks to them best, so that they can understand the message of the Gospel. God has used our role in aviation to help make these translations possible. Your partnership with us has also made these translations possible. We could not be on the mission field without people like you, people who are partners with us in our ministry with Wycliffe and Lutheran Bible Translators. We appreciate your prayer and financial support and your words of encouragement. We know that we are not alone because we have a great team of people supporting us. Your partnership with us is vital, and we want to say thank you. Okay, well hopefully that gave you an idea of what our life has been like the last 23 years in Papua New Guinea. Um, the next thing we're going to do is actually just give you an update on each of our kids. We didn't include them in our video this time because our their lives are changing so quickly that a couple months down the road it's going to change and so we figured it was easier just to tell you live and in person about each of them, what they're doing. So we're going to start with our youngest, Rachel, who is here. Um, Rachel graduated just this past June from high school at Ukarumpa International School, where, uh, where she uh, grew up. And uh, so she graduated there in June, and then um, she had a very small class. Um, she only had a class of about, uh, there were 10 of them, I believe, when they graduated. So that's her graduating class. Um, they have now scattered all over the world. Um, uh, to their own passport country, some of them to America, but some of them uh, to, to different countries. So I'm not really sure if they'll ever get to see each other again. So it was a difficult, uh, difficult goodbye for all of them. Um, and so that's what she did in June. And since then, it's been a, a bit of a flurry trying to get her ready for college. We come back and have to do all of those things that you would normally do throughout high school, um, but got her ready as far as making sure she had a U.S. driver's license and uh, uh, had some money, so get her set with a checking account and all those sorts of things that um, we had to do very quickly in a couple months. Um, so now Rachel is attending Concordia University in Wisconsin, just down the road at Mequon, which is why she was able to join us today. Um, so she is there starting her freshman year, um, very much enjoying it so far. She um, uh, has had uh, some really good classes and uh, teachers, but also her roommates as well. So this is Rachel with her two roommates. Um, Michaela and Kayla. She feels like a bit of the oddball with her name being Rachel, but um, but they've all uh, all get along very well. Michaela, the girl in the middle, is actually somebody that she knows from our home congregation back in St. Paul, Minnesota. So they were once they found out they were going to the same school, uh, we're very excited that they could room together. But those three are getting along very well. Uh, so far, so far, so good. Rachel is uh, studying to become a high school math teacher. Uh, so that is what she will be doing. So that's Rachel. Um, and then our next one, uh, we'll go from, we're going from youngest to oldest here. The next one is Leah. Leah graduated in December of 2021. And uh, she graduated with a degree in elementary education. Um, and she, with a, with a math minor, and so um, we weren't able to be here for that, but she did take some pictures and sent that to us. After she graduated, um, Leah actually came over to Papua New Guinea with us. Um, she, she made the trip over so that she could be there for our final six months in Papua New Guinea before we left for good. Um, so what she did was she came over and she worked actually as an aide uh, in the first grade and the third grade classrooms while uh, while she was there during these last six months. So that's just one of the pictures of us. Uh, you can see right behind us, I'll just point out, it's a little hard to see, but that's actually our house right there that we lived in um, for the last several years. 
Um, but she was there to teach and using her skills to do that. She is actually currently back in Papua New Guinea. Uh, she initially came back with us in June, spent about four weeks in the U.S., but they had a huge need for teachers. Uh, they were very short staffed, so they asked Leah if she would be willing to come back and teach uh, for, for, for a year, but she was willing to give them six months. She wasn't sure she could do a year at this at this point, but she's actually back there uh, right now. This is her in her classroom in the second grade classroom. So she is teaching uh, second grade over there and very much enjoying it, um, is loving what she's doing and is kind of living out her dream to be able to go back and teach in the school where she grew up. So that's what uh, Leah is currently doing. And this is just a picture that she sent to us just last week um, where she's just enjoying being able to see her friends. These are some uh, people that went to high school at the same time that she went to high school. So all uh, people that she knows and um, is good friends with, so they were able to get together again just this past week and, and have some fun uh, doing that. So that's Leah. Julia um, actually graduated in May of 2020, so she was one of those that had a graduation without a graduation. Um, so she did graduate, and her dream was also to come back to Papua New Guinea and to teach. Um, so she did that. She actually came back with us. We were here in 2020 for a few months because we came back for our son Nathan's wedding. And uh, Julie came back with us at that time. We were able to finally return in October of 2020. She took over teaching first grade uh, from the principal who was teaching at that time until she could get there because they didn't have another teacher. And she has absolutely loved it. Um, so she did that from October 2020 until, uh, until we just returned in June this past year. She came back with us. And um, so this is her in that first grade classroom in Papua New Guinea. Um, so she came back with us because she wanted to get a few years experience uh, teaching here in the US. So she's actually currently teaching at a Christian school called the King's Academy in Florence, South Carolina. Uh, which is actually just about an hour and a half from where we're currently living in North Carolina. Um, so she's teaching there, and uh, she's moved up in the grades, so she's actually teaching a fourth grade class this, this year. Um, very much enjoying that. She said she has a bunch of sweet kids who um, love her and, and spoil her a bit, bring her all kinds of little treats and presents, and, um, but a really good class with, uh, again, a great staff, which she's very thankful for, and just wonderful parents as well to work with. So, so she's doing that and will probably be there for at least the next few years and we'll see where she goes after that. So that's Julia. Um, Nathan, um, so Nathan and Julia, if you uh, didn't know, they are twins. And um, so Nathan uh, got married, as I mentioned, in July of 2020. We were able to come back for the wedding. Um, we got out just before the last flights kind of closed for international flights and there weren't any more. Um, so we were thankful that we were able to get out in spite of COVID, come back to the U.S. and be here for the Nathan and Sarah's wedding. Um, so that was a wonderful experience. Thankful we could do that. Uh, we did get caught a bit because of the whole COVID thing going on. Um, so we thought we were going to return six weeks later. Uh, we actually returned in October, but it's okay. It gave us a little extra time to be with family, do a little bit of speaking. It was fine. So Nathan and Sarah um, got married in 2020. Nathan then continued on with his flight training. He was halfway through his training for both ma aviation maintenance and then flight his second year. Um, so this is just a picture of him there uh, with one of the airplanes he flew. He attended the School of Mission Aviation Technology in Ionia, Michigan. Um, it was a two-year program, very intense. Um, and at the end of that two years, he did graduate, got his bars, and, um, and, is a, and be, be, was able to uh, graduate as a private pilot. Um, he's currently uh, looking now to just build his flight hours. They would love to go back over, go overseas uh, together where he can um, do what Jonathan was doing and fly translators. Um, Sarah actually just went through the Deaconess program at Fort Wayne Seminary, and they're currently actually living in um, Perry, Iowa, where she's working, doing an intern uh, for a year at a Lutheran nursing home there. Um, so they're currently there for the year. Nathan is trying to build some flight hours uh, as he's able to and uh, looking to go overseas eventually. So those are our four kids, and Jonathan will come and let you know what our future plans are.
One little correction to what Carrie said about Nathan. Um, he got his private, private pilot's license, but also his commercial, and instru commercial license and instrument rating. Um, so now he needs to build just a bit of experience before he's ready to go overseas to the mission field, which is, which is his goal. So Carrie and I are now, uh, have now transitioned to work at a place called JARS in Waxhaw, North Carolina. JARS is the technical support branch of Wycliffe Bible Translators, providing technical and logistical support for Bible translation to make Bible translation possible. And one of the key things that JARS provides is, is transportation, specifically aviation transportation. And so the aviation headquarters, our worldwide headquarters, is located at the JARS headquarters in, um, in Waxhaw, North, North Carolina, which is just south of, um, of Charlotte. And so what I'll... You can go to the next picture. So what I will be doing is I'll be working at the aviation training headquarters there um, to train missionary pilots for service on the mission field. And you may say, well, what training do we need to provide for missionary pilots? You might have gotten some clue a little bit from the video that I showed. Um, the the pilots, at, pilots that get training here in the U.S. are trained for flying here in the U.S., and not for the specific challenges that we have on the mission field. And specifically, it's the short airstrips, the soft airstrips, and the fact that our airstrips there are not maintained to the standards that they're maintained to here in the US. So I have to know as a pilot, when I fly over an airstrip to assess it to see if it's safe for landing. And I'm looking for things like, is there standing water on the airstrip? Are there pigs or chickens or things that are running around <laughs> on the airstrip? Um, has the grass been cut? How recently, how short is the grass? Is it possible that there's ruts and things like that? The other thing is our airstrips there are not generally flat. A lot of them are on the slope, uh, slope of a mountain. So it might be 10%, 15% upslope that I'm landing on. And so you need to learn the skill of as you're descending, approaching to land right before touchdown, transitioning that to a climb so that you climb just as you're touching down because the airstrip's climbing and you don't want to impact it too hard. <laughs> so those are the sorts of skills that we learn. Uh, there's other skills as well, uh, navigation skills and flying in amongst the terrain and the mountains and not having the resources we have here of weather reporting and air traffic control services. And there's all those kinds of things that we need to know when we fly in the mission field. So using the experience that I've had for 23 years in Papua New Guinea, um, I'll be using that to prepare the next generation of missionary pilots, such as my son and others that are getting ready to, to uh, go overseas. So, uh, so that's what we'll be doing in North Carolina. That'll be my role um, going forward. And what's the, let me just see what we got next here. Yeah, I want to turn off the uh, projector. Just hit the button twice. <laughs> all of my all of my children are very very interested in aviation, um, but yeah, none of them, none of the girls, decided to do to be uh, yeah to go and become a pilot. Huh, my computer just froze up on me here when I disconnected it from the projector. And so I need to find the next part of our presentation to share with you. Sorry about that. So it's coming up here. So over the years that we've been in Papua New Guinea, as we shared in the video, um, in the t 23 years that we've been there, 100 New Testament translations have been completed. I have had the privilege of attending a dozen or more of the dedications of those New Testaments. And I'd like to share with you about one of the more recent ones that I went to, the Gizra New Testament dedication, which was dedicated on December 6, 2020. You may wonder, did translation work continue during COVID? And I'm pleased to tell you that yes, it did. 
And it was really kind of neat because on December 6, 2020, that was the first dedication that we had had of a New Testament since March 2020 when COVID first hit. And so it was kind of neat to be able to celebrate in the midst of still trying to figure COVID out and, um, you know, social distancing and mask wearing and all that kind of stuff. Um, we were able to celebrate a New Testament. Bible translators Nico and Elie von Bodegraven began working among the Gizra people 27 years earlier in 1993. So that gives you an idea of how long it takes to finish a translation. What a special joy it was to see the culmination of so many years of hard work. There had been many times over those years when I had flown Nico and Elie and their two children to or from Western province so that they could do their translation work. But this was my first time to Kalule village where they lived. I flew a plane of 10 people out for the dedication. Kuleli village is not an easy place to get to. It's very remote. From our mission center to Ukarampa, it's a 90 minute flight to the nearest airstrip called Daru. That covers about 90% of the distance to get to Kulele, but the journey is far, from less, far less than half over. In Daru, we went down to the coast and climbed into a 20 foot dinghy for the two hour boat ride to the village. The boat ride took us down the coast and then up a little river to our destination. When we arrived, the entire village was standing on the riverbank to welcome us. They don't get many outside visitors and there had, they had been preparing for months for the celebration of receiving the Bible in their own language. In fact, people from miles around came for the celebration. They welcomed us with lays and singing and dancing and then fed us a feast. The dedication was the next day. It was filled with all of the pomp and circumstance common in PNG culture. There were lots of speeches and lots of singing and dancing. By the way, when I say PNG, that stands for Papua New Guinea, in case, in case you didn't catch that. The moment came for the prayer of blessing and dedication of the Gizra Bible. That was done by the United Church Bishop, Reverend Tiate Kelly. Then the first box of Bibles was opened by Sir Gibbs Salika, who is the Chief Justice of Papua New Guinea. He happens to be a Gizra man, and he was the keynote speaker for the program. One of my favorite takeaways from the Gizra dedication is what a Gizra man said after receiving his Gizra Bible. He said, this is clear. Now we can understand it. The official program came to an end, but the celebration went on. In fact, the singing and dancing went right through the night until the next morning. Fortunately, I was able to get some sleep because I had to fly back the next day after the two-hour boat ride back to Daru. I'm grateful for the 27 years that the von Bodegravens dedicated to the Gizra people so that they now have God's word in their own language, the language that speaks directly to their heart. I'm grateful that I've been able to support this project with air transportation for the last 23 years. And I'm grateful for those of you who have partnered with us in this ministry. Thank you for the part that you have played in seeing the Gizra people and many other language groups in Papua New Guinea receive God's word in their own language. Carrie and I do switch back and forth, so we have to keep switching the <laughs> microphone back and forth. Here. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting better. Oh, oh, yeah. Didn't think about no glasses. Okay. Could you make the font a little, a little bit bigger? Yeah, we can do that. I didn't think about that. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this was not what we were expecting. Life would turn upside down, and all we could do was do our best to roll with the punches. I think you may know what I'm talking about. COVID. Well, when we returned to Papua New Guinea in 2019, after our last furlough, we were expecting our final three years there to be normal. We couldn't have been more wrong. COVID affected everyone we knew around the world, but how did it affect us in PNG and more specifically our family? Well, we've gotten that question a lot. So this is my attempt to answer that and try to explain how our last couple of years in PNG went for us. Well, like many of you, life has been challenging. Living overseas in a cross-cultural setting is challenging enough, but throw in something that was completely new and unexpected, and life just became that much harder. How do I even put into words what it was like? 
The biggest loss for us was friends and coworkers who had to leave. When COVID hit, so many people had to leave to return to their home countries, and we are still struggling to get many of those people back. The sudden lack of personnel left huge holes that the few of us that were left were trying to fill without burning out. We quickly realized that we just couldn't con continue to do everything we'd been doing, and many services were cut. Our school was very low on teachers due to COVID, and I found myself at school almost full time, even though I'm only supposed to be working part time. The few teachers we had were rotating through being in isolation due to illness, and for several months I was basically on a two week rotation filling in for teachers as they were in and out of isolation. Well, one of the hardest things was the tight restrictions put on travel. Traveling within Papua New Guinea became very challenging as traveling between provinces was not allowed or was only allowed if you were traveling for business. And even with that, there were health screenings to be done before you could fly and forms to fill out. Because of the tight travel restrictions, it meant that for over a year, we couldn't travel anywhere to even go on vacation. This was really hard at a time when getting away for a vacation was what we really needed. And if we thought domestic travel was hard, international travel was practically impossible at times. Well, you may remember, as I mentioned before, back in 2020, we were back in the US for Nathan and Sarah's wedding. We had plans to return to PNG in late July, but due to constant changes in international travel, our tickets were canceled and rebooked five times Ooh. before we were finally able to return in October of that year. I now regret ever complaining about international travel in previous years. <laughs> it, it was a breeze compared to what was required during COVID times. Vaccination was required and proof needed to be shown. Negative COVID tests had to be in hand before boarding our first flight. Controller approval from the PNG government was needed. Health forms had to be filled out for each country we were traveling through. And so much paperwork needed to be scrutinized at most of the airports that we traveled through. Countries were constantly closing their borders, reopening, and then closing again. So you were never quite sure until you actually made the trip if it was going to work. Living in that kind of uncertainty is exhausting. Gatherings couldn't happen. School music concerts were canceled. High, uh, high school plays couldn't happen. Church was limited to anywhere from 20 to 100 people at any given time, depending on whether our province was considered high risk or not. All sports were stopped for both the community and for the school. We missed normal social interaction with our friends and coworkers. And yet, in spite of all that, as Jonathan mentioned, work continued. The school was able to meet in person for all but three months of these last two years. Translators found a way to continue their work until they were able to get back out to those remote allocations. Flights continued to happen, taking language workers in and out of villages, Bibles to language groups, sick people to medical care. And despite the obstacles, some Bible dedications were still able to take place. So, in spite of everything going on in the world, God is faithful and his work could not be stopped. I'm sure you know the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators and Lutheran Bible Translators is to translate the Bible into the language of people groups around the world. So now I want to share, you, share with you a little bit of information about Bible translation. Bible translation has been going on for centuries. One of the first translations into English was done under the direction of John Wycliffe in the thir late 1300s. And you probably also know that Martin Luther translated the Bible into German in 1522 because he wanted to make the word of God more accessible to the people of Germany. And we're celebrating 500 years since that momentous occasion this year. 
Today, there are about 700 languages that have the full Bible and around 1,600 languages that have a New Testament translation. 1,600 languages may sound like a lot, but keep in mind that there are over 7,000 languages in the world. Put another way, there are about 1.5 billion people that do not have a full Bible in their language. That is why we work to support Bible translation. We have a passion for all people to have access to God's word in the language that speaks best to their heart. As you know, we spent 23 years working in Papua New Guinea. There are over 800 different languages spoken in PNG. And as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, during the last 23 years, almost 100 New Testaments have been completed by Wycliffe and LBT. And that's counting the ones that happened prior to us going to Papua New Guinea 23 years ago. There's a total of 217 that have been completed to date. But there's still a lot of work to do. Work is currently being done in about 135 languages in PNG, and there are about 250 languages in which Bible translation work has not yet been started. Around the world, there are more than 1,800 languages still needing a Bible translation started. Sometimes people ask us why we don't teach people English rather than going through so much trouble to translate the Bible in their language. But let me turn that around. What would you do if the Bible were not in English? Would you be willing to learn Greek or Hebrew so that you could read God's word? I think for many of us, other than pastor, the answer is no. <laughs> many people in PNG and around the world are still waiting to have the same privilege that we have as English speakers. That's why we are supporting Bible translation. And thank you for partnering in our ministry so that together we can make it possible for more languages to have God's word in their heart language. So now I want to speak just a little bit about supporting our ministry. We do depend upon individuals, congregations, groups to support the work that we're doing. Even though we're transitioning from overseas mission service to a U.S. assignment, training others to go overseas, um, that doesn't pay very well. And so we still depend, in fact, it doesn't pay at all. <laughs> so, so we still depend upon uh, individuals and groups to support our ministry. Um, we are grateful for um, the support that this congregation has given us in the past over the years and for individuals among you who support us. We thank you for that. And when I say support, I don't mean just financial support. I also mean prayer support. Um, we do send out a newsletter. A number of you are on our mailing list. Um, and we thank you for your prayers for our ministry, for the encouragement that you give to us. Uh, to help you remember to pray for us, we have on our display table back there a prayer card. This is new. You don't have this yet, Aunt Barb. So, uh, so grab one of these. We will be sending it out to our mailing list very soon. Uh, for, so those of you on our mailing list will get one, but get one now so that you can get the, get the early copy. Um, we just, just printed these like a, a week or two ago, so it's very, very fresh. Um, but anyway, we, we would like you to put this somewhere where it will remind you to pray for us. Maybe that's in your Bible with your devotion book. Maybe it's on your refrigerator. If it is on your refrigerator, we have a stack with magnets on the back. So you can find the stack with magnets and put that somewhere where you'll see it and it'll remind you to pray for us. Oh, you'll see how we've done the prayer card this time is with Carrie and I here and our kids in the background there in an oval. Um, now that uh, they're all off on their school and doing their own things, but we, 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 didn't, we wanted to still show, though, that they're part of the family and we know people are interested in seeing them. And um, so we, we did that. If you would like to receive our newsletter and are not on our mailing list yet, uh, we do have a sign-up sheet on our display table. So you can go there and, and sign up for our newsletter. Um, if you would like to support us financially, um, we can be supported either through Wycliffe Bible Translators or Lutheran Bible Translators. And so uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators has this fancy brochure with our picture on it. And inside there's an envelope with a tear-off sheet so you can put a check in there. Make the check out to Wycliffe Bible Translators, and then as long as you include this card, it has our name on it so that when you send it in this envelope, Wycliffe will know that you intend your gift to go to our ministry. And so they'll put that towards our ministry, and they will send you a tax-deductible receipt with another envelope and card that you can send in for a future gift. 
Uh, the same works with Lutheran Bible translators. They have this simple envelope, and it's just got a flap that you fill out. Uh, again, our name is written in there, so when they receive it, they'll know the gift is intended for us. And uh, they will also send you a tax deductible receipt, a envelope, and another slip that you can include for your next gift. Um, if there's anyone interested in mission work and would like to know how you could get involved personally, we'd sure love to talk to you because as Carrie men mentioned, the numbers are, are, are low on the mission field. There is a need for more workers in the harvest field. And so there's many ways that you can get involved, whether that be through Bible translation work, whether it be a pilot, whether that be a teacher, those are the things we've mentioned today. But um, we need medical people, we need financial people, we need administrators, um, we need construction and maintenance people, and the list goes on and on. Just about anything it is that you do well, there's a way to support missions through, through that job. And so if you're interested, please, please talk to us and let us know. And so what we've done now is we've allowed a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. I'm going to ask Carrie and Rachel to come up um, because you may have a question that is about what Carrie did or what it's like to grow up as a missionary kid there or something like that. And so, um, so yeah, we done with that. We can close that down. So any questions that you have for us about anything we covered or things we maybe didn't think to talk about? What does JARS stand for? Yeah, right, okay. I assume it does. It, it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. JARS stands for Jungle Aviation and Radio Service, um, which we, I, we didn't share that because it's more than that now. But it started out 50 years ago um, as a, just that. It provided aviation service and radio service. In the years since then, they've discovered that transportation needs of missionaries include more than aviation service. It could be boat service. It could be uh, motorcycles or four-wheel drive vehicles. And technology is more than just radio. It's internet and computer and media and other things. So, so they no longer are just limited to that, but that's where the name comes from. Yeah, great question. Yes? Um, I'd like you to relate to us if you could. What do you credit... Um your whole family getting into mission work? Is it your parents, your grandparents? Um, I knew all of them. Yeah. And uh, it must have been somewhere in the family. But... All of that. We have, we have a great, great heritage of, of godly parents and grandparents. And so um, gra my grandparents on both sides were very committed Christians. And so they instilled that in my parents, who instilled that in us. Um, it was, uh, I, I guess I'd have to say the grace of God because I don't know for sure. I can only, I can only you know, theorize or whatever. Um, but my parents did not only instill in us um, Christian teaching, bringing us up as, as, as Christians, um, but they, they made family important. And so each of us children was, was very important. And, and really, you know, their priorities was God, family, and ministry was after family. And so even though ministry was important, their family was, was more important, and they showed that. So each of us kids, you know, felt very special. But we observed them, and we saw the impact that the ministry was having. We saw God's Word. You know, they were Bible translators, and we saw God's Word impacting lives and it was it was hard to miss that and so um but ultimately i'll circle back again grace of god you know god got a hold of each one of us and called us into it and when god calls you into something there's no better place to be you said here am i send me here am i send me that's right that's right yes uh-huh yeah your daughter i would like to know what it was like growing up over there any specific question about what it's like growing up, or just um, what was life like? What was it? You can just hold it, or you can put it on your head. I'll just hold it. Um. Okay. What was it like? Um. Well, first of all, it was amazing. Um. I wouldn't trade my experiences for anything. Um. Specifically. 
Hmm. Talk a little bit about the school. Okay. Like, you, know, you have tunnels so, that can see that view. Okay. <laughs> Was there tunnels in Bombay? <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so school, it was all, um, you would walk outside to the classrooms. Each classroom was like an individual building. Um, our class sizes were really small. There was like 10 to 15 to 20 people in the class. Um, there was about 100 people at our high school. It was very small. CUW is a bit different. <laughs> There's a lot more people. Um, it was also nice. The weather was always good. Um, well, even the rain was good. It was fun to play outside in the rain. Good, meaning um, comfortable temperatures. Not that it's right. sunny all the time, but yeah. we didn't have to put coats on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, a normal day would be waking up and going to school um, and then maybe hanging out with friends afterwards. Um, it's a lot more common in PNG or in specifically Ukarumpa, where we lived, um, to just hang out with friends. Um, Technology is about, well, ten to five to ten years behind. Um, so, yes, we didn't have much of that. Um, How long of a drive was it for you to go and visit your friends? <laughs> um, we didn't drive as much. Um, <laughs> we did have a car, and that's what I learned to drive on, but it's a manual car. It's with a stick shift. So that was a bit of an adjustment getting here to... Um, to drive in an Our automatic car. Driver, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, but we pretty much walked anywhere that we needed to unless it was raining. So to, to get to school, it was a five minute walk for me. Um, my farthest friends would live maybe 10 to 15 minute walk away over the rough, hilly, bumpy, rocky roads. Um, but yeah, um, there's about there's about 19 nationalities in um, Ukrumpa, in the Mission Center, and in my class specifically, there were six different countries. So that was, let me just see, any more, any follow-up question on that, or did that kind of hit what you were wanting? Yeah, I was kind of like, just what your life, what about, did anybody have bicycles at all, or no? Yeah, bicycles is pretty common, another common way to get around. If you're willing to go up and down the hills, <laughs> yeah. Did you ever homeschool your children? Um, no, actually, I, I never, I never did homeschool them. Okay. So they, yeah, they all attended from preschool through grade twelve. They all attended and that's the school. The school where Leah and Julia. Yep. Yeah. Yes. That's where Leah and Julia. Te- yeah, that's where they and taught. That's where you taught. And that's yes. where I was. Yep. So it was all the same. Oh, all the same school. Okay. Yep. The school. The school has had two campuses. It had a primary campus and a, a secondary campus. So grades one through uh, grades preschool through fifth. Preschool, kindergarten, one through five are at the primary campus, which is where Carrie and Julie and Leah have all taught. And then the secondary campus has a middle school and a high school. Oh, so it's okay. sixth grade through twelfth grade there. Okay, thanks. Oh, John, what did you have to buy from her this weekend? <laughs> we had to get her some warm clothes. <laughs> We, it's family weekend at CUW, and we came to visit her, and she said, um, can you guys buy me a coat? <laughs> We're like, oh, didn't, haven't we gotten you a coat yet? Yeah. You're going to need that here, and a scarf, and some mittens, and some boots, and yeah. So yeah, that's what we have to buy on Friday. <laughs> so it's starting to get cold here in Wisconsin. I'm, for you Wisconsin people, I know it doesn't feel cold yet, but... <laughs> For someone who hasn't experienced anything colder than like 70 degree weather. <laughs> yeah. All those years you got so used to those temperatures, I'm sure it didn't even think of it. Yeah. Well, it's been so long well long. and the other thing is I, I've saved my coat from each furlough that we've come before. You know, about every four years we come and so I just put the coat in storage and get it out again and so I thought Rachel would get her coat out of storage, but she's grown. So. <laughs> um, yes. When you were in high school there, did you, were you able to take many classes online, like some of the kids do here, even college type classes? Um, yeah, that not really until recently. COVID sort of changed that, so there's some people that will do like online school, but that's not connected to the high school there. Um, the internet in PNG is not very 
fast oh, or so reliable. So you didn't really do it that much. No. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I actually did online school for the second half of um, 2020 because we were stuck in the states and I had to start school in um, in August. So I did f finish up my online school through the end of that year. Um, but there was times where I wasn't able to do school for a few days or even a week because the internet had cut out. And sometimes like watching videos didn't work very well. So you can do online school there, but it's not as practical. I think we should probably wrap up there. I think you guys normally like to wrap up around noon and we're getting to noon. so. This is probably a good time to, to wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a bigger turnout than I expected on a Packer Sunday. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Really, really appreciate your just your encouragement and support, and, and even and even being here. Thank you. I just uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, just as a heads up, all the Federalist families are going to be our mission of the month for November. So just so you're aware of that. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Feel free to have a look at our display table out there on your way out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.